Welcome to the Be Smart Podcast. I'm Cameron, your new co-host and the managing editor at jareddillionmoney.com. And of course, joining me is the brains behind the operation here. Jared, it's good to see you. Welcome. I don't know that I'm really the brains. <laughs> I, I think so. <laughs> but this has been, uh, we've been talking about doing this for a few months, so it's good to finally get it off the ground. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh th- this podcast is going to be this this is going to be good. This is going to be good. Um, you know, as you know, I did the podcast for by myself for a long time. And uh you know, it gets a little a little boring talking to yourself over and over again. So this is going to be good to have a conversation. So. Yeah, for sure. Today I kind of want to talk about the um common fallacy in the personal finance space that having money is the product of a million small daily decisions. And it's something you wrote about how Susie Orman and Kevin O'Leary are anti-coffee and small purchases. Actually, Susie Orman said, it's like peeing $1 million down the drain in lost investments. I want to focus a little more on Dave Ramsey, though, because he's getting a lot of backlash in the media and especially on TikTok with younger generations. So uh, actually, there's a there's a hashtag going around that's Dave Ramsey wouldn't approve. So really, in, in many ways, no worries is it's pretty much the alternative to Ramsey's approach and the antidote to all his bad advice. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit on on Ramsey and what he's saying about about all this coffee stuff that's going around. Yeah. So first of all, um, it's funny. I got a reply to that newsletter I sent out this morning about the coffee and it was from a very successful derivatives expert on wall street. Um, somebody who's been in the business for 30 plus years and has killed it. Absolutely killed it. Um, this guy has a lot more money than I do. And he says to me, he's like, you know, I don't think this, he hasn't read my book. Um, but he's like, I don't think this is such a good idea. He says, you know, when I worked on Wall Street, uh, I made coffee at home. I didn't buy bottled water. I rode the subway. And that's why I'm worth what I'm worth. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. You're worth what you're worth because of the work you did and the trades you did and the funds you started. And that is how you made X amount of money. It doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you took the subway instead of a cab, right? If you took cabs everywhere back then, you'd still be in the same spot, right? It, it, the little stuff does not matter. So like I said, he hasn't read my book. Um, but you know, and look like I will concede that the accumulation of small things can sometimes, sometimes turn into big things. That's not the way with coffee. You know, if you can spend 900 bucks on coffee a year, it's fine. Um, if you went out to dinner every night for a year, then that would be like $35,000, which is, that would be a big thing, but small things like coffee just doesn't matter. Like really what's more important, what's going to change your life from a financial standpoint is perhaps whether you get stock options, right? If you get stock options in a company that's growing, that is going to turn you into a millionaire, not the $900 a year that you're going to save on coffee. So, um, you know, Dave Ramsey talking about Dave Ramsey, like he's, you know, he's done a lot of good for a lot of people. The people who he has helped out are people who are spending addicts, right? They have spending addictions and he he gets them off credit cards and and using cash and he has this envelope system which i don't understand and he he basically breaks their spending addictions but that's really a small percentage of people in the country that have these types of problems right and what he's proposing is a one size one size fits all solution for everybody like it's unreasonable to tell people or ask people to not have credit cards, right? You cannot function in civilized society without a credit card. I went out to lunch this afternoon at a place called Carolina Roadhouse. I got a salad I paid with a credit card, right? I'm not going to be financing the salad. I'm not going to be paying interest on the salad. 
I will pay the credit card bill off at the end of the month. And basically I get a month of free money, free interest. And that is the way to use it. Credit cards are a convenient way to pay for things and nothing else. They're a crappy way to borrow money. So I'll let you talk. So you're, you're pretty active on Twitter. Are you, have you seen any, anything on Reddit and TikTok? I mean, what do you think is the cause of all this recent backlash with Ramsey? Do you think people are just tired of hearing the same old thing over and over about, about this kind of stuff? Uh, I think that's part of it. I also think that people, I think people, they, they're not necessarily doing the math behind this, but I think they understand intuitively that this philosophy that it's a million small decisions that determines whether you have money. I think they un understand intuitively that that's not the case. You know, I mean, look, like I still am a pretty cheap guy, right? I have never ordered DoorDash in my life, right? I'm not going to pay a $25 delivery fee for a Big Mac. Okay. It's just something I refuse to do, like just out of principle. So it's not like, it's not like I go around like spending all kinds of money on stupid small stuff. Right. But yeah, I mean, the other thing, the other thing we haven't talked about with Dave Ramsey, which we should talk about is his investment philosophy. And he has said in the past, he's like, Oh, it's easy to beat the S and P 500. I'm like, really? It's easy to beat the S and P 500 when only about like 11% of fund managers do it a year. Like, you know, his, and this is the crazy part. So his philosophy is that everybody should be in growth mutual funds and he calls them growth stock mutual funds and he hyphenates the growth stock. I don't know why he does that, but it's a growth stock mutual fund. And he should say, he says, you should all, you should put all your money in growth stock mutual funds because they return the most. Now, the crazy thing about this is, is that for the last 10 plus years, that's actually been right. Like that's, that's actually, he, that's worked, right? But this, this idea that you should invest in something because it returns the most is simplistic at best and just idiotic at worst. Something that returns a lot also probably has a lot of risk, right? And if you, if you stuff people into funds that, return 12, 13, 15% a year, it comes with a lot of volatility, which causes a lot of stress. So really the biggest premise of no worries is it's not, the goal isn't to make the most money. The goal is to be happy. The goal is to be financially happy. So if you, if you trade off a little bit in the way of returns and you, 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 you're able to experience lower volatility and less stress, then that's a good trade-off and that's what I'm trying to get people to do. Right. It's all about not blowing yourself up. Um, that's my favorite section of the book, by the way, is the, the section on risk. I think that alone is worth more than the price of the book. Uh, full disclosure, when COVID hit, I definitely succumbed to the uh, the DoorDash thing and it was awful. <laughs> I, can't, I don't even want to know how many thousands I lost getting food delivered, <laughs> but I have, I've cleaned up my act a little bit in that regard there. Uh, so I'm going to read you this quote I found from somebody who was bashing Ramsey on TikTok. Her name is Kate. So she says, I recently went viral for having $30,000 in credit card debt, and it even got picked up by Newsweek. There was an article featuring my credit card debt. And throughout the comments, a lot of people have been recommending different, you know, financial gurus. And of course, people have been recommending Dave Ramsey. So here is why I do not subscribe to Dave Ramsey's snowball effect and his approach in general. So for starters, the entire premise of his plan hinges on having extra money to put towards. So you pay off everything. You pay your bills, you pay all your credit cards, you pay all your debts, and then any extra money you have, stop right there. Who the f has extra money? So then he's like, aha, yes, if you don't have extra money, get a second job, get a third job, eat rice and beans. That's actually something I joined a Dave Ramsey, like private Facebook group. People all, all the time reference rice and beans, rice and beans. Like, I'm sorry. I'm not willing to do anything to get out of debt. 
I'm not willing to eat rice and beans every day. I'm not willing to have three jobs and not spend time with my children. I'm not willing to forego my favorite salad on a Friday when I feel like getting one. My bills and my debt is so tremendous that $20 here, $100 there is not making an impact. The cost of living and low wages is to blame for the financial woes of most Americans. And being told that we can incrementally make these big differences if we just give up our quality of life for five, 10 years is absurd. So I wanna get your take on this. I'm not willing to do anything to get out of debt because it, because it seems like a very defeatist kind of attitude. Like I get what she's saying that the small decisions are not moving the needle, but there are a lot of people that are just like, screw it, I'm in debt. I'm never going to get out of debt. Well, I mean, you can live with debt. I mean, you can do that. And you can have, uh, you know, $50,000 in credit card bills that you're paying $10,000 a year in interest on. And that's $10,000 that you don't have to spend on something else. Like a lot of people don't do the math. They're like, you know, credit card interest is 20%. So if you have 50 grand in credit card debt or 100 grand in credit card debt, that's 20 grand in interest that you're, that's it. You know, like I say in the book, interest, paying interest is profits for the bank and you don't want to be a good customer of the bank. Right. So if you don't want to get out of debt, you can stay in debt. That's totally fine. You're just going to have a lower standard of living and that is by choice. So what she's saying is I am choosing to have a a lower standard of living because I am lazy or don't feel like doing the things I need to do to get out of debt. Now, one of the things I talk about, no worries is, you know, is the revenue side, right? So eating rice and beans and cutting expenses and doing this austerity to get out of debt doesn't work very well, right? And one thing she said, which was a key point was she says, I'm not willing to work three jobs to get out of debt. Well, interestingly enough, working three jobs would probably have the greatest impact on her getting out of debt. She would get she would get out of debt a lot faster if she had more revenue coming in. It's more important to do the work on the revenue side than the expense side. So I don't think you have to live in poverty to get out of debt, but you do have to be willing to do some extra work, to bring in some extra income, to start paying off this debt, or you can just live with it. And that's a choice. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pass any judgments on that choice. I'm not going to say she's a bad person because she wants to live with debt, but she's going to have a lower standard of living, which I don't think anybody wants. Right. Makes sense. I think there's an overlap there with, I mean, Ramsey does preach the revenue side. So there is a little bit of similarity, that similarity there between what you you're talking about and no worries. One of the big things is his take on credit cards. He is a big advocate of the snowball method, which I've read your stuff. I know you're not the biggest fan. Can you explain what the snowball method is, why it's dumb and a better alternative? Yeah. So there's, there's basically two ways you can pay down credit card debt. One is a snowball method. One is the avalanche method. And the snowball method is where you take the account that has the smallest balance and you pay that off first. And then you pay off the account with the next largest balance. And you don't pay any attention to the interest rates. The avalanche method is when you pay off the account with the highest interest first, right? So Dave Ramsey is, he's not an idiot. Like I know what he's getting at. Like he, like he's not dumb about this and he understands human psychology. So what he's trying to do is to get people to pay off an account and close it and put up a W on the board. So they feel better and say, look, I accomplished something. I was able to get this account to zero and close it. And now I can move on to the next account. The problem is while you're doing that, you're paying higher interest on all these other balances, which um, it could be hundreds of dollars per month, you know? So really like uh, you just have to attack the account with the highest interest first. If you have a credit card with like a 30% interest rate 
and you have other ones with a 20 or 15% interest rate, you got to go after the one with the highest interest rate first. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. It's more of this. The snowball is more of a psychological win instead of using the math. Yeah. So what other besides because this there's so much rhetoric out there about anti coffee, what other small purchases do you see financial quote unquote experts peddling that drives you nuts? Um going out to lunch is a big one. I've seen going that. out to lunch is a big one. Um that's that's something I'm guilty of, but um one of the one of the reasons so my situation is I think unique because um, you know, I have my own business, but I, I rent an office, which is 35 minutes from my house and I commute and I'm in my office from 8 AM to 4 PM. And if I bring my own lunch, then I don't go outside. You know what I mean? And if I'm in my office for eight hours and I don't go outside, I'm miserable. You know, it's, it sucks. Like I need to go out, get some fresh air, see some people like that's, that's really the main reason why I buy lunch. Now, once I move into my new house, the office is going to be in the house and then I'm really not going to go out for lunch. And, but I'm going to have my kitchen at home where I'm going to have all kinds of good food. Like one of the things I hate about bringing lunch to work is you have this Tupperware container and you have a salad in it and you got salad dressing sloshing around in it and it gets all gross and it's warm and it's just, it just, it just sucks. Like I hate it. So yeah, you, have, you I have a funny, you have a funny line in your, uh, in your Jared Dillian letter about your, your Newman zone on your desk and your, how it's just eating. That's miserable. <laughs> yeah, there it is. And it's just a miserable existence. I totally get it. When you're stuck yeah. inside all day. So basically I spend $4,000 a year going out to lunch, which is a luxury, right? If I was, if I wanted to save $4,000 a year, I would bring my lunch to work and it would be less than that because I'm still paying for the food. But if it look, if I wanted to save $4,000, I could stop going out to lunch, right? For sure. So, but the difference is I can afford it. Now, if you're making $40,000 a year, you don't want to spend 10% of your income on lunch. Like that's, that's definitely bad. But if you're making six figures or multiple six figures, you can afford going out to lunch. It's fine. So, so for the people who are making, say, forty thousand dollars a year and they're working full time, what is your advice to those people? Let's say, let's say they're working full time, and in order to get a new job, they would need to go back to school or something, but they can't afford it. Is it okay for them to take out student loans in that case? Really, for for somebody of very limited means, um, if you have a high school education, go to community college, right? Like, go to community college, which is practically free for all intents and purposes. Like, go to community college for two years and then decide if you want to transfer to a four-year school. I had a student in in my class last semester who did that, went to community college for two years. It was free, transferred to Coastal Carolina, and he was working while he was going to school to pay tuition and he was going to graduate without debt. So it's possible. Like people do it. People do it. And you know what? It, you know what? It builds a lot of character. What is your take on... Ramsey's emergency fund philosophy. Basically, he says if you are in debt, you should have one thousand dollars as a starter emergency fund. Do you agree that you should have that amount, or that you should aggressively pay down your debt before starting an emergency fund, or should you start a bigger emergency fund and then pay down debt? I think you should should start a bigger emergency fund and then pay down debt. Um, you know, I talk about having $10,000 or six months worth of expenses. Um, there's a balance, right? Like the money you put in your emergency fund, if you're not paying down debt, you're paying interest on that debt and it costs money and I get it. But I think $1,000 is not sufficient for an emergency fund. For example, 
I mean, you could easily, you could get the check engine light in your car. You could have a car repair that's three or $4,000. $1,000 is not going to cut it. And then you're going deeper into debt. So I do think you need to have at least a $5,000 emergency fund to start with before you start paying down debt. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jared, for taking the time today. And if uh, if you're listening to this and you're not in our new Jared Dillian Money community slash app, whatever you want to call it, uh, definitely get in there. We've got some new products. Check it out. And Jared, we'll talk soon. All right. See you.